I think Dr. Faru gave a very holistic view, which, uh, which really exemplifies the needs for Malaysia and we cut the sentence and stop by many Muslims in the country, of course, Malaysia in general. Now, if many of you have actually found out about this program through reading the introduction, I think one key because if you go back to any debate, you can't just see whether the or or some state on its own. Khaled Ramadan has always been put in it. You have to see the context as well as the text. So not necessarily the text that should matter, but also the context of the time. And I believe Malaysia in the 80s, one of the most memorable, momentous occasions, uh, momentous developments at the time, which cannot be ignored, was the Iranian Revolution. And very much, among other things, it was driven by the sentiment, the anti-Islam, the Shah Hussein, arguably by a, a lackey of America. And anything anti-Islam at the time was seen as good by the ruling elite. This gave way, of course, to Khomeini's rise. And you see, unfortunately, or fortunately at the time, Muslim movements everywhere were inspired by Khomeini's promises. And religious conservatism, the zeitgeist, marked the era at the time. I think this is important. So you put Malaysia in the larger context of the developments around the world, around the globe. Of course, you know, after that, the inspiration quickly turned sour as the revolution faced a democracy deficit and turned against many of its champions, including Ayatollahs. Ayatollahs, who were seen as progressive liberal, were sent uh, with a life imprisonment to die uh, during that state. So, certainly, this is something that you have to take stock. And now, how markedly different is this zeitgeist, the time, the spirit that is being felt not only by Malaysia, but of course through the Arab awakenings that took place. Um, I have to, to mention this because again, when we're discussing the issue of Hudud of Islamic State, I think it would not be wise if we don't put it in context. Now, the demand during the Arab Spring was for greater freedom, greater civil and political liberties, made not from those educated and belonging to the West, but local Arabs, local North Africans and Middle Easterners, coming together and overthrowing old corrupt despots. And a year after the Arab uprising, the Egyptians successfully elected members in the new Legislative Assembly Parliament. The Egyptian Parliament was dominated by the Muslim Brotherhood, Freedom and Justice Party. And the Freedom and Justice Party, which is now to be a new party, was guided by principles of truth, justice, and equality. And such pronouncements led to rest, apprehension, and fear stemming from alarmist international community. So I have one minute left. It's crazy. <laughs> Okay. I thought I had at least more, but anyway. So, note to other speakers, if you mention the time it doesn't mean they will give you more time. I'm just kidding. Now, I will end with this. I will end with a recent pronouncement, decree made by none other than the then Sheikh of Al Azhar, Dr. Ahmed Al Tahi, on the 8th of January 2012. Why? Because when Dr. Fadu mentioned each jihad, it is incumbent on us to relate, to relate any laws, any policies to the current needs of the time. When people are clamoring for democracy, when people are clamoring for true multiculturalism, and this is what policymakers must do to give meaning, to give soul to such pronouncements. Now, Dr. Ahmad outlined four basic freedoms 
And I'm just going to touch on the first freedom of belief. Freedom of belief and the associated right of full citizenship for all, which is based on complete equality in rights and duties, is regarded as the cornerstone, uh, as the cornerstone in the modern social structure. This freedom is guaranteed by the authentic, conclusive religious text and clear constitutional and legal principles. Accordingly, I will end with this, Mr. a time paper. Any aspect of compulsion, persecution, or discrimination on the basis of religion is prohibited. Everybody, everybody in society has the right to embrace any ideas he chooses without encroaching upon the right of society to the maintenance of divine faith in light of sanctity according to all the three Abrahamic faiths. So everyone is free to perform his or her rituals and none should cut the other's feelings or violate the sentence of his rights, whether by words or deeds, and without breaching the public order. And I end with this final statement. If the mind and the text are apparently conflicting, the mind should be given precedence and the text reinterpreted. So, for me, it was a very powerful statement from the dynasty post Arab awakening. And again today, I ask you to really accept, breathe life into the term that Thay Ramadan mentioned. Multiculturalism is the fact of life. There's no going for it or going against it. And that's why I feel to a point the topic today is rather academic since Malaysia is a multiculturalism and we remain guided by the principles of the federal constitution. Thank you very much. Um, I will just uh, begin my uh, comments immediately. Um, now, what I noticed, uh, which I find very refreshing, is that in the past, it was common, it was common in Malaysia and other multi-ethnic countries to criticize the idea of the Islamic State on the grounds that we are a multi-racial or multi-ethnic society and therefore it is not appropriate to apply Islamic law to, uh, to non-Muslims. Now this I've always found to be a weak argument because I think the stronger argument is that the idea of the Islamic State is problematic for Muslims as well. Now what I mean is, the idea of the scholars, of many scholars of Islam, uh, their notion of the Islamic State and their interpretation of the Sharia is problematic for Muslims themselves. Now, as Dr. Ahmad rightly pointed out, the notion of Dawla Islamiyah or Islamic State does not occur in the, in the Quran, but the conception of rule based on Sharia is unanimously agreed upon by the scholars of the ulama of Islam. However, the issue that is contested is what the Sharia means, how it is interpreted, and whether it defines the state or whether it is subordinate to something larger than rules, laws, and regulations. Whether the Sharia is subordinate to shall we say, the spirituality and universal values of Islam. After all, when the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, um, was working in his mission to bring Islam to, the, to mankind, he said that God had brought him to bring morality to mankind, not rules and regulations. The famous hadith of the Prophet, Inna Allahi Bipa'athani Li Utamnima Makarim Al-Akhlaq Wa Kamali Mahasim Al-Af'al God has sent me to perfect the nobility, the nobility of morality and the beauty of action. Now, obviously I think all Malaysians no, and it's been pointed out uh, by, by many people, including uh, our chairman uh, uh, earlier on, um, uh, that there is a need for a state which deals with problems, whatever you call the state, Islamic or otherwise. 
problems such as ethnic discrimination, corruption, inefficiency, crime, and so on and so forth. Now, if you want to call such a state an Islamic state, I'm very happy to do so. There will be no argument. And in that sense, a secular state can be an Islamic state if it is based on universal values and is fair to other religions. If that is what is meant by the Sharia as a code of conduct, then I think everybody will support the idea of an Islamic state. But not a state that is obsessed with Hudud laws, which by the way, as Hudud laws have been conceived of by the early scholars of Islam, by many of the early scholars of Islam, does affect non-Muslims. For example, in the opinion of many jurists in the past, non-Muslims would be subject to um, you know, various um, uh, punishments such as um, for adultery and so on and so forth. So the idea that non-Muslims are exempt from Islamic law is uh, a fallacy. Um, there is therefore a need to rethink what we mean by Islamic law. Uh, for example, Hudud laws is stoning to death uh, part of Sharia, in the opinion of many scholars of Islam, it's, it is actually something that is derived from Jewish law, and this is confirmed by uh, a Jewish. Uh, uh, in fact, I spoke to a Jewish rabbi, uh, an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, about this. This is confirmed. But Muslim scholars themselves uh, disagree about the extent about whether it is part of Islamic law. The only kind of Islamic state for Malaysia is the one started or established by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, by the so-called Constitution of Medina, founded on cooperation with and the rights of other religions such as the Christians and particularly the Jews. It is very interesting that this was the basis of the first Muslim state. It was founded based on a series of agreements that the Prophet made with the Jews and the Christians of Medina in which they had, uh, in many ways, more rights than minority religions have in Malaysia today. And finally, I would like to say, what is more, most important is the spirit governing the state that we have. The Prophet Muhammad once said of a Jewish lady who, by the way, was a prostitute. She was a prostitute, but because he saw her act in a kind way to a dog, dog was thirsty, she lowered her shoe into a well to draw some water and fed the dog with the water. The Prophet said that she would be forgiven her sins. Can we have Islamic leaders with such spiritual outlook? online. If we can have some Islamic leaders, then I'm all for an Islamic state. Thank you.